Take a seat, we got some announcements for you guys and check these out. Good morning, Kensington. We're so glad you're here with us today as we begin our new series, Broken and Beautiful. I'm Shauna Schwaniger, a Central Teaching Pastor, and I want to personally invite you to these upcoming opportunities here at Kensington. First, Thanksgiving baskets. Would you join me in this favorite tradition? Kensington has been distributing Thanksgiving baskets to local families for 27 years. The impact is huge and so are the smiles. Now last year, in the midst of the pandemic, we decided to provide gift cards as a main dish of the baskets so that people could purchase their favorite foods and create a feast fit for their own families. The recipients were so excited, we're doing the same this year. There are two ways you can participate, donate and deliver. Every $50 donation fills a basket, and then we hand deliver the baskets to a local family on Saturday, November 20th. Sign up early to deliver. Spaces always fill up quickly, which says what about this community? That you are eager and excited to love your neighbors and be the hands and feet of Jesus. I love it. So find out more about Thanksgiving baskets at kensingtonchurch.org slash Thanksgiving. And if Kensington is your home church, baskets are also available to you if you need one. 
just call our main office at 248-786-0600. The other invitation I have for you is baptisms. We have baptisms at all of our campuses on Sunday, November 21st, and that's just a few weeks away. Baptism is something we get really excited about around here. It's a step of faith and a profound moment of surrender to Jesus. We rise up out of the water with a sense that new life that we have in Jesus. I have been a part of many baptisms over the years, and I love hearing the personal stories about each person's faith journey. So if you feel the tug to be baptized as an outward sign of what God is doing in your heart, find out more and register at kensingtonchurch.org slash baptism. Okay, now back to our service. We're in the first week of our series, Broken and Beautiful. And I think this whole idea of God using our brokenness is so encouraging and incredible. In God's loving hands, our broken pieces cannot just be mended, but made new. And the final result is even more beautiful than before. I believe God has something special to show us today about who He is and how He works in our lives. Thanks for joining us. Man, cool stuff. How's everybody doing? Woo, this side's doing good over here. Maybe this side's going to wake up a little bit still, though. It's good to see everyone. Hey, uh, by the way, wasn't that song incredible this morning? I thank God. They did a fantastic job, man. What a way to open up. So good. As people are still coming in, we've got so many good things happening around here. And one thing that we love to be part of is Thanksgiving baskets. And so uh, uh, how many of you, just raise your hand, have you ever been part of that where you've donated, you've delivered? It's incredible, man. So, and if you have not, I just want to encourage you to be part of that. You have an opportunity to be a blessing uh, in a real specific way to a family around Thanksgiving that may feel distant from God, may feel like God has forgotten about them. And it gives us an opportunity as a church to remind them that we are grateful for them, we love them, and God has not forgotten about them uh, at all. And you have a chance, if you want, to be a delivery driver. And so there's going to be two times we can do this. It's 8.30 and 10.30 on the 20th of November. Uh, Marie and I will be there with their family, and you can come get a basket, and you have an opportunity to deliver that. If you don't have, uh, like, ample time to do that on that Saturday, please consider donating. Because when you donate, it really, literally will go right to a family uh, and be a blessing to them. So I, I just want to encourage you, just think about that, pray about that. Uh, it could be a cool opportunity for you and your family, your loved ones, uh, to participate in that. So uh, good stuff coming up, too. We've got baptisms going on the 21st. And uh, I actually talked to a gentleman this morning that signed up already. Uh, he's going to get rededicated. So whether it's you're looking to rededicate your life or you're looking to get baptized for the first time, we'll do that here on the 21st. Uh, this is something, even with family, if you've got a child that want, is ready to do this and you want to jump in the tub with them too and be part of that. So I just want you to be praying about that, be praying about for people that are considering taking that next step. And it's just an awesome day with tons of music, tons of celebration, hearing about Jesus working in people's lives in a profound way. So we're excited about that. Hey, we have got cool news too. Clinton Township, we have had our interim pastor there, uh, Craig Mays, who's been an amazing individual to love on our Clinton Township campus, part of our Kensington family uh, on the east side. And we have got uh, our, finally our new senior pastor that's going to be there, Adam Kirshner and his family. Uh, and I don't know if I can show some pics of Adam. Do we have? Oh, we don't. Never mind. So you can do this. You can Facebook Adam. So you can actually just stalk him a little bit. Adam Kirshner, but he's incredible. We've met him a few times. It's been fantastic, and so we're super pumped about that. And so Clinton Township is so excited uh, about their future moving forward there, and so we just wanted to share that. Well, as we step into the series, uh, we are looking at what I think, honestly, is one of the most profound things ever about the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ finds people not when they're at their brightest moments and at their best. It, moreover, always finds us when we're at our worst, we're desperate, we feel destitute, and we feel like we're all done. And Jesus steps in and he feels like, hey, I know you feel like you're at your worst, but I'm about to do my best work. And I really do think what's incredible is so many of us will discount each other and say, we're broken or we're busted or we're unforgivable or, 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 or you know, I'm, I'm full of shame. And Jesus says, let me restore that and build something so beautiful. And so we want to, as we kind of prime and move into this way, uh, and Cliff Johnson, by the way, is here today to kick us off in this series. So I love Cliff. So when he gets up, uh, man, just give him a warm welcome when he's here. But um, it's just this idea that Jesus really does take the broken parts of our life and he mends them together. And they're not like he, where they're just stitched together. He reunites them together and he creates something even more beautiful. And there's nobody I've ever met like Jesus that can do something like that. 
And so just watch this video and just to get a, a concept, to have your mind and your heart and your hope begin to move in that way of what Jesus does in our lives. We live in a society that often throws away what is broken with quick and sometimes cheaper replacements. It's the same with our own lives. We're quick to move on and disregard these issues and experiences that have shaped us. In doing this, we often miss how much more beautiful and powerful life can be if we embrace these moments. The journey of restoration can be slow and is unique to every individual and circumstance. God uses our broken moments to display His grace and beautiful restoration of not only our lives, but our futures. Man, we are just so excited to be jumping into this series to really discover just how is it that Jesus actually makes things new, makes things beautiful from our brokenness. And in this first week, we're actually gonna be talking about how God calls us co-creators, how he lifts us out of our brokenness and then blesses us with the gifts of the Spirit to co-create with him when in whatever space we're in, where he leads us to. And we're gonna sing this song called So Will I because it just captures the essence of all creation, what all creation was meant for. If all of the things that are seen and unseen we're made to bring glory, to bring praise, to worship God. And we were made to co-create with him. That is so, so beautiful and powerful. And I know that that phrase co-creators can sometimes make us feel like, maybe if you feel like you're not an artist or you're not a musician, you're not you know, creative, that maybe you disqualify yourself, but that's not it at all. It's not about that, it's not, be, it's not about being artistic, it's that God has put specific gifts inside you, each and every one of us, every single one of us in our community, in this world, to co-create with him in unique spaces that he could only do through us. And so I'd love for you as we sing this song, if you want, you can stand and you can worship with us or you can sit and let this wash over you, but I want you to think really hard and I want you to ask Jesus to reveal to you, God, what is it that you may have put in me? What gifts what things have you put in me that you want me to co-create with you at work, at home, wherever, whatever space it is you lead me? What is it that you have put in me? So I want you to really think about that and ask him to reveal that to you. Are we seeing this?
such a beautiful song, isn't it? I think it's so interesting that, that the songwriter chose those poetic and lyrical words to really just highlight a God who is incredibly detailed in creation, a God who cares about every little seemingly if it insignificant thing. He cares about it. It matters to him. It matters to him who you are today. It matters to him the story that you're living right now. It matters to him the argument you had on the way to church this morning. No one needs to identify themselves. But for those of you who are are married or in relationships, why is it that the way to church is like the most fertile soil for the worst arguments? Uh, I've been in ministry now for a little while, and there was a season where I spent a lot of time with young adults, and so many of them got engaged, and then they would kind of prepare for marriage, and so my wife and I would sometimes do their premarital counseling, and the very worst, most crazy, insane, breaking new ground arguments that we had would typically be as the couple's on their way to our house for counseling. I'm like, I'm not sure we should really be talking to them about anything to do with marriage. Just amazing how that happens. But no matter what story you find yourself in right now, your story matters to God. Not once you have your act together. Not once you stop fighting on the way to church. Not once you clean up your act on Saturday night. Not once you put on your Sunday best or have enough money to buy Sunday best. We don't even care about Sunday best. Just Sunday, be here. That's not the God that we're talking about today. We're talking about a God today who has crafted you, shaped you, molded you, placed you in the story you're currently living in for a purpose. Now, when I look back at my life and I think about Cliff Johnson as a teenager, uh, I don't think I was anybody's first round pick, to be totally honest. I hit a pretty crazy growth spurt, and so I was tall and uh, pretty skinny. I thought I was very cool. I thought every girl liked me, and if they didn't, well, what was wrong with them? Uh, in third grade, as a matter of fact, I sent a note, because I'm, I'm a maximizer. Any other maximizers out there, Strengths Finder? You're already thinking of five ways to make this message better. Thank you for that. Uh, I was like, why waste time trying to figure out which of these girls likes me? So I put together a checklist, and I said to each girl, you know, check the box if you like Cliff Johnson. If you don't, just pass me over. That's fine. And, but the, the mistake was I had a girl handed out that was my, like, kind of sidekick, but I didn't ask her because, you know, I wasn't interested in her. So that was, a, that was a not a good start to my life, I think. I got in trouble, and the teacher read the note out in front of the class, which is cool because in that moment, some of the girls were like, ew, and some of them were like, ooh, he's kind of a bad boy. So I had that going for me in third grade at Blairstown Christian School. 
it faded quickly. But I remember laying in bed as a teenager, literally 13 years old, staring at the ceiling, 13, 14, 15, and just being so pressed and so anxious about what am I going to do with my life? Now, it's only now that I'm discovering that's kind of weird. And then I've met 25 and 27-year-olds that are now finally asking that question. But I could not sleep at night. Why? Because my parents had told me, especially my mom, that I was some miraculous child that was born, and she had made a deal with God after many years of wanting to have children. They adopted my oldest sister, Lori. A year later, they gave birth to my sister, Candy, which happens sometimes. And then four years of prayer and deal-making with God, according to my mom, I mean, she got to the final deal where she said, if you give us a, ch- a son, I promise he will be a pastor. I'm like, that's a check that I've got to cash that she just wrote. So my whole life I'm staring at these pastors in front of me going, I don't want to be the guy that people say, wow, that guy's boring. I don't want to do that for a living. So like I picture my childhood when I was born, kind of the moment where Simba's held over the pride. You know, the, you know, it's kind of fun at Ford Field when they do that with, with the little kids. And then they're always hoisting one guy up who's had too much to drink, which is always funny. But I felt like I was held over the pride. Like here he is, he's the future ruler of something. So my dreams for my life, it was like I had this tension in my heart because I knew what my parents told me I was going to be, and yet I didn't want that, of course, but I'm like, you know, I wanted to be the first baseman for the New York Yankees. That was my dream for most of my life. Still is, but I think I'm at 45. I think they might have moved on, although based on how we played in the wild card game, I might have done better, um, but that's all right. Um, so I just remember thinking and thinking and praying and literally being like frustrated with God, be like, why? I just felt this tension that was placed on me. And yet what's amazing is I had these dreams for my life. I thought, boy, if I could just be a major league baseball player, or I would argue with my teachers at school because I'm an Enneagram 8. So that was all laid there beforehand. Uh, So I would argue with my teachers at school, and they would say, wow, you should be a lawyer. I'm like, hmm, lawyer, that's interesting. Maybe I'll do that. Just whatever career would give me the most money and the most fame or notoriety or whatever, you know, that's what I wanted to do. But as I look back on it, I'm like, man, my dreams for my life were so small. They were small compared to what God actually had in store for me. Teenage years can be some weird times. And if you look at Jewish culture, young adults or teenagers weren't super important yet. They didn't really have much value. They didn't have much of a place. In fact, in Jesus' day, in the first century Judaism... Young, young men who were under the age of 20 weren't even considered uh, necessary for them to pay the temple tax. It was something that every male over the age of 20 contributed. And it was something that was, that was kind of there in order to keep the work of the temple going. They weren't considered necessary to do that yet. They weren't seen in any kind of special light. They were seen as kind of the least powerful people in their culture. And yet you look at Jesus... And you know Jesus is God in the flesh. He comes down. He lives for 33 years. The last three years of his life, he spends pouring into a group of disciples who then he leaves after he dies on the cross, raises uh, from the grave on the third day, and then he leaves and ascends up to heaven. And he says to them, okay, now go start the church. He hands off this incredible task to them, this incredible dream, this incredible responsibility. And because of those 12's faithfulness, we're sitting here today. And so you would think that those 12 that he chose, my goodness, they must have been the top of their class. They had to be the best of the best, the cream of the crop. If you were handing off your company and you had successors and you had a dream for your company, you're not picking the guys that nobody else wanted. You are grooming and interviewing and and sorting through applications and you want to find the next best version of you to take your company to the next level. And yet we look at Jesus' choice of his disciples and it's almost unbelievable. Every one of his disciples had failed out of discipleship training school. Every single Jewish boy dreamt of wanting to be a rabbi. I've talked about this here before, so I'll just summarize it. But basically, they all started in school at five, and from five to ten, everyone learns the Torah, or the first five books of our Bible. They memorize it. Most of them fall out of school at that point and go back to their family trade. Then from ten to fifteen years old, the best and brightest push on to the next level of schooling. And at that point, they're memorizing the rest of the Old Testament, which, by the way, the Old Testament is two-thirds of the Bible. 
it looks equal only because they put so many things at the back of your Bible, <laughs> concordance and important dates and things. But two-thirds of the Bible is the Old Testament. They memorized the entire Old Testament. They knew it backwards and forwards. And yet, even at that level, not many made it past that point. Most went back to their family trade. But a few of the best and the brightest of all were chosen by a rabbi to be part of his Talmudim or his inner circle of disciples that he is trained to then someday be a rabbi after a 15-year journey of life-on-life -life discipleship. So the fact that Jesus calls his disciples and none of them were in a discipleship relationship with a rabbi tells you that they had all been not quite good enough. In fact, that temple tax that I talked about earlier, the tax collectors confronted Jesus and Peter about paying the temple tax to Jesus, Peter, and all the disciples. And they said, hey, why aren't you and Jesus? Are you paying the temple tax? And Jesus said, hey, we don't, we don't need to, but so as not to offend, go catch a fish. It's got enough in its mouth to pay Peter's temple tax and Jesus. Well, why wouldn't he pay the other 11 disciples' temple tax if his desire was to not offend this tax collector? Well, according to culture and according to what was happening here, the other 11 disciples weren't yet 20 years old. Now, let that reboot brrrp, all the artwork and paintings of these guys that look like they're 60 when they're following Jesus. Now see them as 14, 15, 16, 17-year-olds. Now some of the stories make sense in a different way, don't they? So here are these disciples chosen by Jesus, and they weren't good enough. Jesus chose the lowest and the least in his culture. Nobody wanted them to be their disciples. Why do you think the religious leaders were so pushing against Jesus and so against him and so angry? Because he rejected their system of grooming disciples that were awesome at the top of their class, and he chose seven fishermen. Several zealots. I mean, he had a motley crew of disciples that he chose. Why? Well, he was going to craft their lives to be something they never dreamed they could be. The story we're in today is actually in the Old Testament. It's actually found in Exodus chapter 31. And the context of where we are is that for 400 years, the Israelites were oppressed and they were actually forced into slavery and bondage by the Egyptians. And so many of those pyramids and all the incredible building projects, that was built in forced slave labor by the Israelites. Their basic jobs were to make bricks. We found out from Jewish history and some other sources that Joshua may have been a stone cutter, but that was about as advanced as their jobs got. And so we've got the Israelites... They're in slavery for 400 years. Moses then is raised up as a deliverer, and they leave Egypt. Pharaoh finally relents and says, you can go. So they leave, and they head now to the wilderness with the promised land in their minds. They're going to go to the promised land. But in the meantime, they're in the wilderness, and they reach a place called Mount Sinai. And Moses leaves the people and says, I'm going up to meet with God on Mount Sinai. He goes up to Mount Sinai, and that's the moment where God, with his own finger, writes the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets and gives Moses the law, the way that his people can follow him and honor him, the way that Jewish people are going to be set apart from other nations, a beautiful thing. But it took so long for this process to conclude that the people started getting anxious. And he wasn't up there for a few hours. The Bible says that he was up on the top of Mount Sinai meeting with God for 40 days. And by the way, Moses didn't eat or drink during those 40 days, which is unbelievable. So while he was up there, the people started getting nervous and started getting impatient and said, we don't know what happened to this Moses fellow, so let's, let's make us something that we can worship. And they approach Aaron and, and, they, and they confront Aaron and they pressure Aaron. So Aaron has everyone take out their, their earrings and all the stuff they have. And he makes a, a golden calf out of it. And they start worshiping and they start celebrating in front of this golden calf. And so Moses comes down from the mountain hearing what sounds like war. And he sees the people reveling and worshiping in a bad way this golden calf. And it's amazing because Moses is angry, he smashes the, the tablets. And then he says, okay, here's your moment. You choose who's on God's side and who is 
who is against him? Who's going to be on God's side? So 3,000 people went to the other side against God. And the Levites, it says, strapped a sword to their side and went through and killed everyone who stood against them. And 3,000 people died on the day the law came down from Mount Sinai. Now imagine being a teenager, being in this crowd and watching this thing happen. And you're watching friends and neighbors and relatives just give themselves away to an idol. And Moses was so upset, he went back up to the top of Mount Sinai and spent 40 more days with God. Again, without eating or drinking. So for those who have been tempted to do the 40-day fast, know that Moses did an 80-day fast. So that's sort of the unachievable, I think, in that sense. So Moses comes down from that second time on Sinai. And he's got instructions from God. This is what God says to Moses in Exodus 31, verse 1. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God and wisdom, with understanding, with knowledge, and with all kinds of skills. So, before this, God had chapter after chapter in our Bibles exhaustively detailed, intricate blueprint instructions of exactly how the Ark of the Covenant was to be designed and the type of curtain and the type of lampstand and the table of presents and all these sacred pieces of furniture. God painstakingly describes the type of wood and the type of gold and the ornate designs to be put on it. Now remember, Who among these slave people had skills working in jewelry design or gold fashioning or metal metalry or anything like that? Nobody, right? They weren't trusted with that in Egypt. 400 years, that's out of their memory. So God chooses someone named Bezalel, Bezalel to be this. And he says to him, says to Moses, I have filled him with the spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding, with knowledge and with all kinds of skills. So here is Bezalel, and God says, for the first time in Scripture, it says that God filled him with his spirit. Isn't that amazing? Of all the people in the Old Testament, David, Elijah, Joseph, all these other people, here is the moment where God says, I'm filling him with my spirit. Here's what's crazy. What was his task? His task was to create these items. Look at verse 4. To make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze. To cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of crafts. He gave him the ability, as well as wisdom and understanding and his spirit, but he gave him an artistic ability to accomplish this. Here's what's amazing to me. Guess how old Jewish tradition tells us that Bezalel was when he was told by Moses that he was chosen to do this? 13 years old. Any 13-year-olds in here? I won't make you come forward, so now you can tell me you're here. 13 years old! I mean, can you imagine you're just standing in the back of 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 the group playing Fortnite on your phone, and all of a sudden, I'm not saying 13 year olds do that. I'm not saying that at all. My goodness, you, come. But I, what's interesting is he says, I have filled him. He says, get Bezalel. He doesn't say get Bezalel because he's the best of the best of the best of the best in doing this. And he's crafting the Ark of the Covenant, this timeless, sacred, unbelievable, heavenly, supernatural furniture. He just says, get Bezalel and I will give him what he needs. Isn't that amazing? God fills Bezalel with the, his spirit and then guides him and gives him the ability. But here's what's great. This is too big a job for one teenager. He puts more with him. Look at verse 6. Moreover, I have appointed Oholiab, son of Ahissamach, of the tribe of Dan, to help him. Also, I have given ability to all the skilled workers to make everything I have commanded you. So picture the movie The Matrix. If you saw that, great. If you didn't, don't watch it on my account. Just don't. But you're, uh, Neil's sitting in the chair, and they put this like, hey, you want to learn how to fly a helicopter? You want to learn jujitsu? It's like, he's like, it's like, I know jujitsu now. It's sort of that, except not that at all. But it's like, 
God's Spirit filled them, and suddenly they're able to do these incredible skills and have this crafting ability that they never had before. But suddenly, because God's Spirit gave them the ability, He's created them to create. It's such a beautiful picture, and I love it. Bezalel's not alone, he has a helper, and he has a community of others believed to all be younger. Isn't it a beautiful thing when God pours into the next generation and says, you're going to build something incredible and I'm going to help you? Whew. That's refreshing to hear, isn't it? It's refreshing to see that. And verse 11 says, they are to make just as I have commanded you. They're to make them. Here's what's interesting. Who made the golden calf from that earlier thing? Aaron, Right? So clearly Aaron had some skills in metalworking and gold bending. He used fire. He used all this stuff. Moses and Aaron are the celebrity superstar leaders of this movement. And yet God gave Moses all the plans and said, guess what? Now you're going to take the plans and give them to some teenagers because I'm going to help them do it. Why? Because if you look at all of Scripture, how often is it that God chooses the least likely vessel to do the most unbelievable things? Constantly is the answer. Gideon, David, Jeremiah, Joseph, it's practically a prerequisite. Not to mention the disciples in half of the New Testament. God chooses the ones that no one else wants. To do the most unbelievable things. Why? Because who gets the glory when it's done? Do people go, well, Bezalel was the most unbelievable artist. The designs he did on the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant were stunning. That's all true. But God gave him the ability. And Bezalel just surrendered to that and walked in what God had created him to do. He was crafted to craft something beautiful for God. Chapter 36, 1 and 2, Bezalel, a holy ab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given skill and ability to know how to carry out all the work of constructing the sanctuary are to do the work just as the Lord has commanded. Then Moses summoned Bezalel and a holy ab, and every skilled person to whom the Lord has given ability, and who was willing to come and do the work. Isn't that great? To whoever God gave the ability to. There's such a humility here and such a surrender. Anything we do, don't, isn't it refreshing when you meet someone, you're like, wow, you're so good at that. You're like, well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. But God, God gave me that skill. I, I can't take credit for it. God gave me this mind. God, God gave me this, these hands. God gave me this ability. It's just refreshing to not see someone thumping their own chest and saying, yes, I am awesome. <laughs> and that happens far too often. This was a precious and a huge deal. And, and I don't know how your mind works, but my mind was working on timelines always. So how long after they left Egypt did this moment happen, and how long did it take to complete? Well, according to my research and what some commentary said, this started about six months after they left Egypt and was completed about 18 months later. Huge job. Huge project. This was not a side hustle. This was the hustle. This was everything. And they completed it within a year and a half. But you might also be wondering, if your mind works this way, where do they get all this gold? Where do they get all these jewels? Where is the silver? Where is the bronze? Did God say, hey, Moses, go behind this bush that's burning. Don't touch that one. But there's another one that's got a lot of gold in it. There's a tree that's dropping gold bricks. He could have, right? God totally could have done that. But there was something else that he wanted them to do. Verse 3 says, they received from Moses all the offerings the Israelites had brought to carry out the work of constructing the sanctuary. And the people continued to bring free will offerings morning after morning. So all the skilled workers who were doing all the work on the sanctuary left what they were doing and said to Moses, the people are bringing more than enough for doing the work the Lord has commanded to be done. Now, part, part of my mind ran to, well, did they just use the golden calf? I mean, here's this thing. If you think of the Cecil B. DeMille Ten Commandments movie, anyone watch that? Charlton Heston, every Easter it comes around. Uh, that golden calf was pretty big, massive, huge, looked pretty fancy and perfect. Kind of looked like a pinata or something. I don't know what it is, but anyway. You think, okay, well, they must have taken the golden calf because that's a lot of gold. Remember all the earrings and all the jewelry? 
and made this thing to worship, and everyone saw it. They could see it. Hundreds of thousands of people potentially could see this thing to worship it. So that would be a great place to start, right? Except that when Moses came down, guess what happened to the golden calf? It was burned, destroyed in the fire, ground into powder, poured into the river, and then people were forced to drink it that had been worshiping it. So it's gone. So no golden calf. What in the world did they have? What could they use? I love the idea that the people gave out of hearts that were moved by God, too. This wasn't compulsory. This wasn't, hey, everyone bring anything you've got of value. Bring it. Don't hide it. This was an offering. This was free will. Here's what I love. Guess what they used to make the Ark of the Covenant and all these precious items? It's in Exodus 12, verse 35. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed toward the people, and they gave them what they asked for. So they plundered the Egyptians. You think God doesn't know what's coming next? He says, oh, as you go, Moses, here's the list we need. You don't know what it's for yet, but just get it. So the slaves are released. Again, all these plagues came on. Pharaoh reluctantly lets them go. And as they leave, like, oh, by the way, we need all of your money and all of your jewels and all of your gold and all of your silver and all of your stuff. They took all the plunder of Egypt with them into the wilderness. And what wasn't used for the golden calf. So think about this. Think of the type of person that sees a calf being made and people running around pulling necklaces and earrings off and going, no, 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 no. I don't want any part of this. The 3,000 maybe that gave their earrings and said, take it, take it. Let's make an idol. Moses is gone. Where's God? We want this calf to lead us. They're dead now. So the ones who gave the gold and the silver and the fine linen and the bronze were those who didn't contribute to the golden calf. But here's what's amazing. They had all that they needed. God just said, I've given it all to you. I'm just asking for some of it back. Isn't that a beautiful picture of what a tithe actually is? They were slaves. They had nothing on their own. And God allowed them to have treasures. And they said, okay, now, of your own free will, will you give back to me to build this tabernacle, to build this sanctuary, to build this movement, to build the place that my presence is going to dwell? I want to pause there because I think it's a beautiful insight into why we do offering moments here. And this is our offering moment right now. Because everything that I have and everything that you have has been given to us by who? God. Psalm 24 once says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Everything I have. Every ability I have to make income, everything I've inherited, everything that's been given to me, every job I've ever had, all of the resources that I possess have been given to me by God. And God says to me, will you give it back to me? Not compulsory. I'm not forcing you, for God loves a cheerful giver. But out of your heart, will you give back to me so that we can further the work of my church? Isn't that a beautiful connection? And so today... We are going to receive our offering. And uh, you know what? We're still doing the buckets, right? Jeremiah, I should have asked you that before. Or the, there, right there, okay. <laughs> These are things I should have asked before the service. There's a spot as you leave if you want to uh, drop a check or if you want to give um, cash that way. Um, also, for any of you doing things online, you want to give back that way from a cheerful heart that is free. Uh, we've got three ways to give electronically texting the word Kensington to 77977, going through the app, the Kensington app, or uh, doing like my wife and I do through the website, kensingtonchurch.org slash giving, setting up recurring gifts. This is a way, though, I know some of you here every week are like, dude, we know this. You've got 77977 on the brain, right? Am I right? That's it, okay. <laughs> we say this, though, as a way to put your toe in the water to start trusting God, to recognize he's the one who gave me all of this. I want to give it back to him to see his work furthered and moved. It's an ancient practice that has futuristic implications. And he invites us to do it, but he wants it to be done with a cheerful and a grateful heart. So the people gave, and they gave so much, it says, that the craftsmen had to stop and go, we've got too much gold. I don't know if that's ever happened. Too much 
God, they just keep giving. They're so excited about what you're going to do. They recognize all the stuff from you. They keep giving and giving and giving. But when you read, some of you have done the read the Bible in a year plan. Has anyone attempted that and stalled out in like February because you got to these very chapters in Exodus and went, what is going on with this, ta- with this tabernacle? My goodness, I don't care that it's acacia wood. I think there's a deeper purpose in it. It's not just because there's blueprints. It shows the heart of that song, So Will I. It shows the heart of a creator that cares about every detail in his creation. He wants the finest gold to be there because his presence is going to dwell among his people. And that is a special and a sacred and a powerful and a supernatural thing. So therefore, let's use the finest treasures. Oh, by the way, I gave you the treasure anyway. And you can keep 90% of it. Just give some back to me so we can build this beautiful thing. It shows God's painstaking detail and how he knows and how he loves and how he raised up a teenager named Bezalel and some of his friends who in and of themselves were just teens hanging out in the back of the room. And he says, nope, Moses, I've chosen them by name and I've given them what they need to make these precious items Moses and Aaron and Joshua, you aren't going to be a part of this. You pass on what I'm trusting to you. Because remember, at this point, Moses was 80 years old. Now, I know you're like, again, mental image. I'm just destroying mental images here. So age Charlton Heston a lot more. Way past Planet of the Apes time for him. Way, like, more into NRA season for him. You know, like, truly 80 years old. And think about Christian Bale. Exodus, gods and kings. He's like 35 at best when he's crushing it across the Red Sea. He's 80. So he's saying, hey, old, guy, old guys, pass this off to the younger generation. Pour into them, invest them, give them the plans, give to them what I've given to you. It's something very symbolic and beautiful there. But here is this God who does this over and over and over again. Jeremiah 1.5 is a beautiful picture of this. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. This is in response to Jeremiah, who, by the way, was between the ages of 13 and 17 when this moment happens. Another teenager. And he's saying, God, I'm too young. No one's going to listen to me. I'm just a boy. I'm a youth. And he says, don't worry about it. Just go where I send you. I have known you since before you were born. I have a purpose and a plan for you. And look at what Jeremiah became. Jeremiah Roy, that is, of course. A life set apart for God from before he was born. How about David? Psalm 139, 13. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. God had set apart and chosen David before he was born. And yet you look at his life, he's the last born of his family. He's the lowest of the low in stature. In fact, when Samuel comes to David's house to anoint the next king, as we heard in a series a few few weeks ago, David wasn't even invited to the dinner or to the lineup. Now, how would you handle that at 13 to 15, which David was, again? Dad, didn't even think I should be there, huh? Someone had to go out and stay with the sheep. And you're right, I am finishing my newest song on my lyre, and I'm writing poetry, and I'm fighting lions and bears and tigers. Oh my, I'm doing all that stuff. And yet, he was the lowest and the last. To the point where Samuel gets done saying, God going, nope, not Eliab, nope, not him, nope, not him, nope, not him. They're all over 20 fit for military service. Again, another over 20 thing. Isn't it cool how the Bible is just so connected? David's not even brought in because he's too young. He's nothing. He's finally brought in. It says that he was ruddy and handsome. Ruddy in Hebrew means redheaded. Again, another mental image gone. So he is a redheaded teenager here. And he's standing before him and Samuel anoints him. He was set apart. 
God, but God was crafting something in him, wasn't he? When he was out in the fields feeling forgotten, he was fighting lions and bears that stole sheep. What did he care? He had, no, he had literally no inheritance from his family. It all went to the oldest son, got a two-third share. The second oldest got one-third, and the rest got hopefully jobs from their brothers. That's just how it went. He had no stake, and his brothers were jerks. We hear that later. They didn't like David at all. And yet he fought lions, and he fought bears to get the sheep back. He went after the one. Does that remind you of anyone later? He was a good shepherd. He wasn't a hireling. Set apart called as a teenager. Imagine when he's sitting in the field playing his lyre, writing poetry, fighting, learning his slingshot. Did he have any clue what God's plan was for his life? God's dreams for David and Jeremiah and Bezalel were so much bigger than their own. But he was crafting them for something beyond their imagination. So what does this have to do with us, you might be asking, you maximizers among us? Ephesians 2.10 is actually my favorite verse in the Bible because it answers a question I always had when I was a kid. If, you, if you've heard in church or you've memorized this, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 is a very well-known passage for it's by grace you've been saved through faith, not of works, it's a gift from God so that no one can boast. It's this beautiful picture of grace through faith. But so many times people leave off verse 10, which is weird because the chapter ends there and 10's just kind of dangling there. But verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works which he has prepared in advance for us to do. Now let's pause on that slide for a while. For we are his workmanship. Here's what I love. That word for workmanship in the Greek, it's poema. And you know what word we get from that now in English? Poem. A beautiful, creative expression of God's creativity. But you know what I also see in that word? Where his workmanship created, crafted in Christ Jesus. Think about Bezalel trying to turn raw materials into cherubim with giant wings and into lampstands with intricate lines and exact dimensions. I don't know about you guys, but when I was a kid and I tried to make that stool, I made a stool and it was, I sat on it and it snapped and I was like six. It was awful. I just, brr, 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 brr. Man, there it is. All right, we're pretty good. Everything was crooked and weird. I did not have that in me, but I was like, ah, it's a stool. The exacting detail, but how does one mold and use and create gold? What has to be applied? Fire. A lot of fire. Has anyone out there been through the fire in their life? Has anyone out there been through a season of intense heat where you're like, God, I cannot take any more of this heat? Amen. And yet what happens when the heat is applied? You metal workers among us. With gold, something comes to the surface. Impurities come out, right? And they scrape that dross, they call it. They scrape that off. And they do it again and again and again to make it more and more and more pure. Crafted, shaped, molded. And I'm sitting here going, God, please, back off the fire, please. I just need a break from this heat. And God says to me, no, you're my workmanship. I'm crafting you. I'm molding you. I'm shaping you. There's going to be seasons of heat. Well, how do you bend metal? How do you make bronze into something? Well, you heat it, but then you take a hammer and you smash it carefully. And you bend it. And then you polish and you sand. All of these are hard processes. If we asked the metal how its journey was, it would be like, it was hot and it was rough, but here I am. We are his workmanship, created, crafted in Christ Jesus. And here's what I love. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 talk about, for it's by grace you've been saved. What have we been saved from? Why do we use that term? Well, we're saved from an eternity 
apart from God. We're saved from the power of sin and death. We're saved from hell apart from God forever. So we're saved from. And a lot of us camp there with our relationship with God. We say, hey, I've been saved from all of these things. But verse 10 tells all of us that you're not just saved from something. You've been saved for something. There's a reason he chose you by name and said, I'm putting you through the fire. I've saved you by grace through faith, but, I, but you're my workmanship. You're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. I have a purpose for you. There is something you're going to do for me, and that something you're going to do for me is something I've been preparing you for. I've been crafting you for. I've been molding you and shaping you and, and burning you at times to get you ready for these good works, which I've prepared in advance for you to do. Those good works, those moments that God has created you for are awaiting you. The future is now. You walk out that door with your eyes wide open. He says, step into the future I have crafted you for. He has made you ready for all of this. And some of us might say, well, why did he make me like this? Why would I have long, gangly arms, super skinny and weird looking at 13 with tons of like just outsized confidence? When I look at pictures, I'm like, why was I so confident back then? Thankfully, I had parents who loved me, but maybe a little too much. Um, but look at what 1 Corinthians 6 says. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. I love that connection. The same painstaking detail that God put into designing the tabernacle and the sanctuary and the Holy of Holies. Why was it so incredible? Because that was where his spirit dwelled. And before the foundation of the earth, before you were even born, he chose you, he called you by name, he crafted you, yes, even your body, even how you look. And he crafted you for a purpose. He's crafted a story in you that he wants you to use for him. You know what phrase I really push back against is the phrase, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. I think that's a lie that has crippled a lot of people. Why? Because then we say, hey, tell me I'm beautiful. World, tell me that this picture is good enough to get a lot of likes. Tell me that, I, that I'm good enough. Tell me, tell me. And I say beauty's not in the eye of the beholder. Beauty is in the eye of the creator who made you and says who you are and gives you value and gives you worth. And then Jesus fills you with his spirit. He sees something in you that no one else sees and he invites you into a future that's beyond what you can imagine. Isn't it powerful to think that the disciples, teenagers, all of them teenagers except for Peter, Jesus leaves, goes up to heaven, and says, go into all the world and make disciples. He says, but you'll receive power when my spirit comes upon you or fills you, and then you'll be my witnesses, and you'll go to the ends of the earth. So when the spirit of God shows up, it's at a, at a time called Pentecost, which in Jesus' day, they had morphed some of the purposes of this, where they were also celebrating when the law came at Sinai. So they're gathering in Jerusalem, 250,000 to a million people gathered in Jerusalem for this important festival. The disciples are praying in the upper room, and the Bible says the Spirit of God falls on them like fire, and they're speaking in tongues of intelligent foreign languages, extolling the virtues of God, and people hear it and say, you guys must be drunk. And Peter stands up with the 11 and says, hey, we're not drunk, it's not St. Patrick's Day. No, I'm just kidding. He says, I I'm not drunk, it's only nine in the morning. And then Peter preaches the message that changes human history. And on the day that the Spirit falls, guess how many people come to Christ and get new life and come to life in Jesus? Anyone remember? 3,000 come to life when the Spirit comes. How many died the day the law came? 3,000. And Paul later says, the law brings death, but the Spirit brings life. A bunch of teenagers who just surrendered themselves that no one else wanted 
Peter preaches the message that changed human history and they were crafted as fishermen and tax collectors and zealots. Their lives have been crafted to the point where now they're going to craft and create the church that brings us to where we are today. That is God's plan for them and that's his plan for each one of us. He invites us into that same journey. Will you see the value you have? Will you see that God has crafted and created you to do something amazing? You don't have to be a singer or a preacher. You can be in any field and do something that God has crafted your story to do. So when those moments arrive, you could step into it. Because in your heart you're saying, I'm his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he's prepared in advance for us to do. Can you imagine living life with your eyes wide open, looking for the moments to step into? I promise you, it's a life worth living. And who cares what anyone else thinks? Does human history tell us what the disciples looked like? Or if they had the coolest tunics in town? We don't know. What we do know is they changed human history because they cared cared more about their creator's opinion of them than anyone else. God, we just, we surrender to you even in this moment. We recognize you have crafted us. You've shaped our lives. You've shaped our stories so that you can use them. I pray that our lives would be a poem to you, a beautiful expression of your creativity and love and grace. I pray, God, even in this moment, if we're holding on to a dream right now, we're holding it tight with a clenched fist, God, that you would help us to let go of it and lay it at your feet, recognizing everything we have is from you. Our skills, abilities, our treasures, our jobs, our families are all from you. And you want us to lay them down and take up what you have for us, which is far beyond what we can imagine. I pray even now as we sing this song that it would be an anthem from our hearts. Have it all. Take it all. Take my life. It belongs to you anyway. It's the powerful name of Jesus Christ that we ask it. Amen.
I'm not sure where you find yourself this morning. And maybe for you, something just jumped out and grabbed you. But what I want you to hear so clearly is that your story matters to God. And your story matters to us. The hard times and the storms and the heat that's been applied to you have been molding and shaping and purifying you. And maybe today you just, you've had your heart broken recently and you just needed to hear that in God's eyes, you are perfect. He's created you exactly the way that he wants you. And in Jesus, the Bible says that, that when God looks at you, he no longer sees your sin. He sees his son. Isn't that a beautiful reminder that, that beauty's not in the eyes of the beholder, it's in the eyes of your creator. And so if you think about your life, you think about what God may be calling you today, God's dreams for your life are always going to be bigger than yours. You cannot outdream God. What he wants is surrender. He wants you to say, God, do with my life anything you want. Have your way with me, God. Did Gideon see a teenager that no one counted on, the youngest in his family, overthrows the Midianites for the glory of God? Did David see himself as the king that would be the greatest king in the history of Israel? Did the disciples realize they'd be building a church that stands to this day? God's dreams for our life are always bigger than ours. Will you surrender yours to him? Will you lay it down and say, God, use me today. I'm your workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which you prepared in advance for me to do. And I surrender my life to you living with my eyes wide open. Will you grasp a hold of that today? Living life. Now as we sing this song right now, will you see that he's called you by name. He's created you to do something unbelievable in this world for his glory. Let's sing out with all of our hearts to him even now. Let's do it.
says we are. We are children of God and he has called us co-creators, beautiful, new creations. It's such a precious thing that we can hold dear to our hearts. Well, thank you so much for joining us for week one of our Broken and Beautiful series. We hope you join us next week. It's going to be amazing. A couple things. If you want to sign up for Thanksgiving baskets, head to the hub. And if you are new here, we actually notice we have a ton of new people. We've got some first time gifts for you guys down at the hub in the lobby. So please head there, check it out, get some information. We love you guys. Prayers available after service down here in the lobby. Have a great weekend.